Hello, welcome to John Berlue Reads Freedom Crossing by Margaret Goff Clark. We just finished up chapter 10. We're ready for chapter 11. Remember, Bert and Laura went into town in chapter 10 to see if they could find Joel and talk to Joel, but Joel was in his house. They weren't letting him out of his house. He waved to him to get back from his window. But Bert and Laura think now they may have figured out Joel's code that he sent them with the book that he sent to Laura. Remember the big haunted house on the river with the many cellars to it, the four cellars? They think that's where they're supposed to take Martin, and Bert and Laura drove by. Bert wanted to go check it out. Laura didn't want to, and they were trying to decide if they should turn around and who came up on them on their wagon. Walt the slave catcher. So that's where we left off with chapter 10. We're going to begin chapter 11. And you might have guessed, chapter 11 is called The House with Four Cellars. Walt sauntered back to the Eastman carriage. What a picture, he said. Brother and sister out for a ride. Though he smiled, his eyes were watchful and he craned his neck to look into the carriage. Wouldn't have a third passenger hidden away, would you? Laura hoped Bert would give an answer, but he was at Sally's head, giving all his attention to reassuring her. What do you mean frightening our horse like that? demanded Laura hotly. Walt's hawk-like face took a hurt expression. Here I was riding peacefully down the road, and your horse almost ran me down. Laura gasped at this outright lie. But Bert said quietly, No need to argue, Laura. No one's hurt. That's right, Walt agreed. Why can't you be sensible like your brother? He turned to Bert. I don't suppose you'd mind if I had a look in your carriage, would you? Can't say I'd like it, Bert said, giving Sally a final pat and strolling back toward Walt. But I'm not going to stop you. At this, Walt climbed into the carriage. Immediately, Laura scrambled to the ground and while he examined every inch of the carriage, she stood tensely at Sally's nose, feeding her sprigs of grass. Walt seemed especially interested in the carriage seat, for he prodded and pushed it and tried to lift it up. The seat, however, didn't stir. Where are you headed, Eastman? he asked. Laura didn't give Bert a chance to answer, for she was ready for this question. It's not your business, but I'll tell you anyway. We're on our way to see our cousin Tessie down the road a piece. A look of surprise flashed across Bert's face, but he recovered quickly. We'd better be moving on, he said. She'll think we're not coming. Walt looked from one to the other. You're not fooling me. I know you're up to something, and I'm watching you until I find out what it is. If you're hiding a slave, I'll see to it you're brought to justice, even if it takes all winter. Laura kept her eyes on the house. Walt had the law on his side, yet, knowing his spiteful ways, she felt sorry for the unfortunate slave he might track down. No matter what the law said, it couldn't be right to turn a boy like Martin over to a man like Walt. Walt's face was dark with anger as he turned his black and white horse around in the road and sped back towards Lewiston. Laura returned to her place in the carriage. Keep going to Cousin Tessie, she said abruptly. Let's make my little lie come true. Bert protested, Boy, but I want to go to Tryon's Folly. I have to find out if it's a likely place to take Martin tonight. Laura glanced up at him impatiently. I want to go there too. You do? Yes. But Walt might come back to see if we're really going to Cousin Tessie's, so we'd better go there and then to Tryon's Folly. Bert looked down at her hands, clenched tightly in her lap. Walt got your dander up, didn't he? Laura nodded. He makes me want to fight. Good. Bert lifted the reins. Giddy up, Sally. Laura tried to recall what it had been like in the cellar at the Tryon house. We'll need a lantern. I remember it was dark in that cellar, even in the daytime, she said. Bert chuckled. You have changed. 
Laura squirmed uncomfortably. I don't know if I've changed. I I'm no abolitionist, but I don't want Walt to get Martin. I'm glad of that, and you're right about the light. We have a lantern. Pa always carries one in the back of the carriage, but I don't have any way to light it. We'll ask Cousin Tessie if we can borrow a few less Lucifers. We won't have to explain why we want them, or do we dare tell her about Martin? Bert shook his head, no. I imagine she thinks the way Pa and I do, but I'm not sure. It's best not to get her mixed up in this. Laura patted the cushion on which they sat. Why was Walt so interested in this? A faint smile lifted the corners of Bert's wide mouth. Some people have hidden compartments under their carriage seats. Do we have one? Not in this carriage, but there's one in the wagon Pa and Abby took to Buffalo. I wish we had the wagon now. It'd make it easier to get Martin through town tonight. He drove in silence a minute and then said, Maybe it's a good thing Walt stopped us. He won't be so suspicious as if he sees me driving out this way again tonight. He'll figure I'm just going to t Cousin Tessie's again. Where will you hide Martin? On the floor, I guess. I'll put the lap robe over my knees and he can lie under it. They made their visit with Cousin Tessie brief. In an answer to her pleas that they stay for supper, they gave the excuse of chores that had to be done at home. As they once again reached the woods around Tryon's Folly, Bert gazed cautiously up and down the river road. Then he turned Sally onto the rough drive that led to Tryon's Folly. Laura did not breathe easily until trees hid them from the road. She could not bear to think of what would happen if Walt should see them riding up this abandoned lane. When they were several yards into the woods, Bert jumped down and broke off a leafy branch which he used to brush out the marks left behind them by the carriage wheels and the horse's hoofs. Don't want anyone to notice that a rig turned in here, he explained. The lane grew fainter as they progressed. Bushes crowded close on either side and the road itself was pitted with holes. Laura clung to the carriage lest she be bounced over the side. Finally, Sally came to a complete halt at a tree that had fallen across the road. We go the rest of the way on foot, said Bert. He stared ahead. Looks rough. You want to wait here? Laura climbed down. No, I want to see the place again myself. I was here so long ago, I can't remember much about it. Bert took the lantern from the rear of the carriage and went ahead. Laura followed closely, picking her way carefully in her thin shoes and holding up her long skirts so they wouldn't catch on branches and underbrush. When they emerged from the cover of the trees, the first view of the house took her breath away. She had forgotten how large and impressive it was. Covered with gray stucco, it was a long rectangular building two stories high. Two chimneys rose above the peaked roof, one near the center of the house and the other on the south end. What a pity Mrs. Tryon never lived in it, Laura exclaimed softly. Then with her eyes on the wall of trees, she added, it would be lonely. I can see why she didn't want to stay here. A person could cut down some of the trees, said Bert. If it were mine, I'd make a clearing around the house and have a big lawn. Then I'd trim enough trees on the riverbank so there'd be a view of the water. I always wanted to live by the water, he confided. You did? So did I. Laura's eyes met Bert's in a brief moment of complete agreement. She realized they had been speaking quietly, though there was little chance that anyone would overhear them. The house was far from the river road and had no near neighbors. In spite of the fact that the walls of the house were solid and undamaged, the place had the look of a ruin because of the many windows that were broken. They'd have no trouble getting inside, Laura thought, though they might be cut by slivers of glass. Bert, however, took the direct approach. He walked boldly up the stairs to the front door and turned the knob. With a slight creaking, the door opened, and he and Laura stepped inside. They found themselves in a large room. At their entrance, a bird flew out of a window, startling them both. Feathers and bird droppings littered, littered the floor of the room, and cobwebs laced the corners. Several dark objects the size of mice clung to the upper walls and ceiling. 
After staring at them for several moments, Laura realized with a shudder they were bats. She hoped they would stay where they were. Sounds like a haunted house, doesn't it? I don't feel right walking in like this, her voice echoed in the unfurnished room. Joel practically sent us here, said Bert. Yes, I'm sure he meant for us to come, Laura agreed, and it isn't as if we were going to hurt the house. She tried to feel reassured about their trespassing. After all, no one had ever lived here. But Bert interrupted her thoughts. Where's the cellar? Do you remember? Laura examined the long room where they stood, noting the huge stone fireplace and the row of windows facing the river. This is the parlor, I suppose, and next to it is the dining room, and then the kitchen. She picked her way across a slippery patch of broken glass to the sunny kitchen, where the fireplace stood ready for use, with pot hooks in place, yet no one had ever cooked a meal in it. I think this goes to the cellar. Laura opened a door on her left. Stairs descended into the darkness. Bert set the lantern on the kitchen floor and knelt to light it. He started cautiously down the steps, holding the lantern before him at arm's length. Laura, following him, knew they couldn't have seen much without that lantern, for the small windows of the cellar were dirty and covered with cobwebs, admitting only a faint light. Bert crouched to examine the floor. Looks as if people have walked through here, don't you think so? I don't know, and let's not waste our time playing detective, Laura circled slowly. We need to find out how to get to the next cellar. A door set in the west wall caught her eye. That must be it. At least it's on the side toward the river. She crossed to the door and pulled it open. Bert came forward with a lantern illuminating a tunnel that sloped downward. From then on, the way was clear, for one cellar led to another like steps descending the riverbank. Laura followed Bert and the dim glow of the lantern through the tunnel down a short flight of stairs to a second cellar, through a tra trap door, and down more stairs to the third cellar, where a spring filled a shallow basin and overflowed into a drain on the stone floor. In this last cellar, they found a heavy plank door. This surely must lead to the river bank. Bert pushed the door open, and he and Laura saw before them a wall of bushes. At their feet, a path wound steeply down toward the river, still far below. Again, they shared a look of agreement. Laura said, this has to be the place where Joel intended to take Martin tonight. So now they really think they figured out Joel's code and that they're to take Martin to the big haunted house with four cellars tonight so he can meet that fisherman and his boat to get across the river to Canada. That's the end of chapter 11. We'll cover chapter 12 next. I don't feel too good about chapter 12. You know what the title of chapter 12 is? A Fugitive is captured. That doesn't sound too good, does it? We'll read chapter 12 next. Thank you for reading with me. John Berlue reads Freedom Crossing by Margaret Goff Clark.